It's baffled scholars for two millennia. It is a puzzle made of multi-dimensional elements, an enigma with roots that reach back to the dawning of time, perhaps before. Daniel explained part of it. Ezekiel and Isaiah had glimpses into it. John saw it all for the time of the end. That time is now. Join Derek and Sharon Gilbert on a journey that spans the course of history, from Eden to Mount Hermon, from Hermon to Babel, from Babel to Rome, from Rome to the cross, and from there to us. Biblical prophecy is coming true before your eyes, and to understand it, you must discern the times both then and now. It's time to unravel the threads of this all-encompassing prophetic paradox. It's time to unravel Revelation. Welcome to Unraveling Revelation. I'm Derek Gilbert. I am Sharon Gilbert. I get to be Sharon Gilbert. I love that. <laughs> Welcome to Studio G1 and the next installment. In fact, this is the last one. Yes, but this was a, really a fitting way to wrap up the, the tour. The previous year, we also visited Jordan, visited Wadi Rum and Petra and uh, uh, Mount Nebo, of course, but we didn't have the same understanding in 2018 that we did when we went back in 2019. And we've learned a few things since 2019 as well. I know. I can't wait to go back because you and I have, over the last five or six years, really been digging into the uh, the culture of the dead, mm -hmm. worshiping the ancestors. Right. And that's why we wrote our books, Gener uh, Veneration and also Giants, Gods, and Dragons, and we're writing The Gates of Hell mm -hmm. right now. But I, I put a lot of that stuff in the Red Wing saga as well. And being there on the ground gives you an insight into antiquity and the way that the pagans saw the world in that whole region of Petra. Um, and of course, we didn't see Indiana Jones. However, <laughs> you can buy an Indiana Jones hat. At the gift shop, at the <laughs> yes, gift the gift shops there, the ones with free Wi-Fi, which of course the ancient Nabataeans set up. They were brilliant It's engineers. very strange oh, to yeah. see <laughs> all of these tents with Wi-Fi coming out of the top. <laughs> but uh, when we were there, uh, the the uh, of course visually it is just absolutely stunning. The architecture of the Nabataeans, which they uh, uh, for which they used Greek architects and artisans to carve these these buildings into the side of the soft red sandstone. Um, st still there 2,000 years later, mm -hmm. the Nabataean Arabs had an extensive kingdom during the time of the uh, the apostles. In fact, their kingdom extended as far north as Damascus. Oh, yes. It the was most huge. powerful king of, of uh, the Nabataeans, Aratas, Plus was mentioned by Paul. Into part of what we would call Israel now. Right, right. So they were, they were not an inconsequential people. They were important back in the day. But what was even more important was the spiritual aspect of Petra. Yes. That is something that we've not really studied or been taught in our churches. And it's a bit of history that most of us don't know anything about, but the fact is it was a pilgrimage site for the pagans. There were idols all over inside Petra. They're everywhere. Yeah. Uh, there's an official, there's a, there's a technical term for them rather. Uh, archaeologists call them beetles, B-E-T-Y-L-S. Mm -hmm. But interestingly, that's from the Hebrew well, it's from the Greek Betilia, but that comes from the, the Hebrew Bet El, or mm -hmm. House of El, Temple of El. Temple these were of... considered houses for the gods, these right. various shapes and sizes, and some of them are big blocks called gin blocks. Yeah. Now, that's not what the Nabataeans called them. This is a term that was invented by later tour guides because it sounds cool. Gin is in genies. But uh, those blocks were a representation of their chief god, mm -hmm. Dushara. Exactly. And we talked about that as we uh, ventured into one of the most fascinating aspects of our tour of Israel, which you wouldn't expect because you don't normally connect Petra to the Bible, but it's in there. Mm -hmm. And uh, we talked about that on our tour of Israel. The treasury, of course, is the iconic uh, structure there, but the Nabataeans carved many, many uh, facades, and, and they're mostly tombs. Mm -hmm. But there are also structures there that indicate that the site was a connection to the other world, the underworld. We're just about to enter, enter the seek that will lead us down to the treasury in Petra, but behind me, you see what's called the small seek. This is a water course based on a smaller wadi that the Nabataeans used to divert the water from Wadi Musa, or the uh, the valley or river of Moses out of the Seek because it was flooding the city in the spring. When the heavy rains come, the uh, Wadi Musa would rise up and wash away whatever was inside the city. So the Nabataeans, 2,000 years ago, dammed up the, the Wadi and diverted the watercourse through here. Even today, 
Visitors to Petra are warned not to go in the small seek during the rainy season or even when there's rain forecast anywhere within about 35 miles of Petra because people go in there can be caught by flash floods and killed. That's why we think there's more to the story of the water that Moses was uh, told by God to provide to the Israelites than uh, perhaps we've been told. We're about ready to enter into the main part of Petra. As you see, the building that we uh, will we'll see when we emerge from the Sikh is called the Treasury, and that's only because the Europeans who rediscovered it in the early 19th century were following a legend held by the local Bedouins that it was the hiding place of a fabulous wealth of, uh, of one of the pharaohs. Uh, not really true. It was actually a tomb. But you'll see the uh, pockmarks on the walls of the Treasury from the Europeans who were trying to bust it open to break the bank, as it were, as it were and uh, get the Pharaoh's treasure. Uh, we're almost there, and emerging from the Seek is one of the most amazing things you can ever experience in this life. We're here at the very entrance of the Seek, and above me is the remains of an arch that was destroyed sometime in the last 200 years. Some of the early paintings by David Roberts showed the arch. But you'll see over my shoulder here a niche for one of the beetles, the gods. And essentially what you've got here are one on either side, guardians of the entrance to Petra, in a sense, making this a Bob Elu or a Bob El, a gate of the gods. One of the fascinating aspects about Petra are the number of idols around the the, the, the whole whole place. It, uh, they're, they're called beetles by scholars, B-E-T-Y-L, uh, beetle. It's based on a Greek word, betilia, which essentially means living stones. And or house of God. Or, well, house of God, because it actually comes from the, uh, the older Hebrew, Bethel. But according to the, the Greeks, the Betilia were created by the sky god Uranus when he was uh, fighting his war against Kronos and the Titans. He created these living stones to help him in his war. Uh, obviously didn't work because according to the Greeks, Kronos succeeded his father as king of the uh, gods, ruled for a while until Zeus and the Olympians came of age. But as we mentioned, they, uh, the word actually comes from the older Hebrew. Beit El, which means house of God. And that derives from the story of Jacob and his vision of the ladder, ascending and descending uh, angels, climbing this ladder into heaven, this stairway to heaven, if you will. That's why so many of the tombs, most of the tombs in uh, Petra and other Nabataean sites have what's called a crow step design. It looks like a stairway going mm -hmm. up and then coming down again. That's what it represents. It really does represent a stairway to heaven. Yes, and you see cube-shaped rocks there right. all the time that are referred to as gin blocks, but I think that they probably have an even deeper meaning. Well, yes, and the gin blocks, that's not what the Nabataeans called them. That was a later name invented probably by tour guides to probably. make it sound more exciting. And I think what they represent in Petra and other places where you find them in Nabataean sites is the same thing that crosses in Christian cemeteries here in the United States and the, and the West represent, that represents the faith, faith. The faith in resurrection. In resurrection, right. That because some of these, these gin blocks, the cubes in Petra, have the crow steps on them. They do. And archaeologists have found that there are uh, shaft tombs underneath them, shaft graves below those gin blocks. We're inside one of the tombs that we've been showing you from the outside with the crow step theme. Uh, this is very cool place uh, 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 temperature wise it's been used as a dwelling for the last couple hundred years by bedouins until recently when the bedouins were moved out of the city to a village built for them up on the hill currently being used now for uh, donkey storage donkey garage basically but the crow step motif is really fascinating because you see it on all of the tombs here at petra but we also see it on the decorations we saw at the temple institute in jerusalem this idea that the stairs connect heaven and earth, a physical representation of Joshua's or Jacob's ladder. Uh, that's what it represents. But the idea has been twisted over time, whereas Jacob set up a rock to commemorate the place where he saw this marvelous vision and called it Beit El, House of God. Um, later pagans took that to mean that the god was in the rock, which is why you see so many of these beetles here at Petra just slabs of stone that were believed to contain the essence of the god that was being worshipped. I think at last count, a scholar went through and took an inventory of all of these beetles inside Petra and came up with a 550. That's a lot. That's a lot. Behind us, you see more tombs here in Petra where the Nabataeans buried their dead. And again, every single one of these tombs has that crow step motif above the entrance. 
they, they didn't leave behind much in the way of texts for to help us interpret it. But again, it's so fascinating that every one of those tombs has that motif, and we saw it on the model of the proposed third temple at the Temple Institute in Jerusalem. There's no doubt that the connection between Jacob's ladder, his dream at Bethel, and what the Nabataeans were trying to recreate here is clear. I mean, th th that connection is there. But they twisted it. The fallen realm twisted it and turned the uh, commemorative stone at Bethel into a an idol, which they believe contained the essence of their god. And some of them are hard to make out because they were chiseled out by the later uh, Muslims when the Muslims took over in the mm -hmm. 7th century. But uh, most of them are, are still there and uh, just very simple. Sometimes it's like a little uh, niche in a wall with a like an oval shape representing mm -hmm. their chief god, Dushara. Uh, sometimes a, uh, a cube, which also represents Dushara. Uh, Dushara, it just means he or Lord of the Shara. Shara Mountains are the mountain range that run along the east side of the Arava, which is that uh, rift valley that extends south from the Dead Sea to the Red Sea. Mm -hmm. uh, in the Bible, that word is Seir, S-E-I-R. It represents ancient Edom. So this god Dushara was to be equated with the national god of Edom called Kaus. That was the Lord of Shara, Dushara. We're back. This is Petra, the entry, or the exit rather, from the Sikh into the area in front of the treasury, which is so-called because the locals had a tradition that one of the pharaohs had hidden his treasure inside the building. And if you look closely at pictures and video of the treasury building itself, you can see the bullet holes from Europeans who had come along trying to bust it open and find the treasure. Of course, there was no treasure here. This essentially, this was a tomb. This was uh, a fascinating place. Seeing that site, I mean, when you see it in the Indiana Jones movie. It's uh, pretty cool, but it, uh, you, there is not a vast, right. uh, you know, domain beyond the facade. No, no. Um, but when you come out of the seek, that, that chasm that, that leads you in, um, and the theater, you get the big screen view, but you don't get the, the 180 degree view that, that you get with your own eyes. It's, no. it's overwhelming. It really is overwhelming. And it's obvious as you walk through there that this is a gigantic mountain, a gigantic rock that was split down the middle. Yes. Oh, yes. We've got some more research to do on that, but mm. there was a biblical story about a uh, prophet uh, striking a rock, rock and splitting exactly. it in half. Yeah. Mm. Well, we'll we'll do more research on that before we go public with our theories there. We've but uh, at it. we we mm. have though. Uh, coming up, we we go down to the colonnaded street, and we this year we didn't do this in 2018. Went all the way to the back of Petra, and we'll explain why that was so important historically and spiritually when unraveling Revelation continues. Israel is ground zero in the long supernatural war in which we all play a part. And during the month of October, our special offer helps you to better understand that war and the land of Israel. Our two nonfiction books, Veneration, about the ancient cult of the dead and the way it drew Israel in, and Giants, Gods, and Dragons, about the strange and mysterious creatures that God declares are real. Plus, the DVD of our Tour of Israel from 2018 that takes you to these key battleground sites from Mount Hermon to the Mount of Olives, Mount Nebo to the Temple Mount, and then on to the mysterious island of Sardinia, where we explored the tombs of the giants, a 6,000-year-old stone ziggurat, and the Tophet, used by the ancient Phoenicians to sacrifice children to the dark god Molech. Bought separately, this package is worth $60, but during the month of October, we're making it available to you for just $35 plus shipping and handling. Our October special, available only at our online store. You'll find it at gilberthouse.org slash store. And again, thank you for your prayers and your support. Thousands of years ago, giants walked the earth. They are long gone, but their spirits remain. The evidence is there for those with eyes to see. Megalithic tombs. Monuments aligned with the stars. And the words of the prophets and apostles recorded in scripture. Now, see this evidence for yourself as Derek and Sharon Gilbert take you on a tour of the Holy Land with special guests, Pastor Carl Gallops and Messianic Rabbi Zev Porad from the mountain where the story began to the mountain where it all ends. Wars of the Gods, Volume 2, Search for the Rephaim. Available now in DVD and HD streaming video. Online at gilberthouse.org.
Welcome back to Unraveling Revelation. I'm Derek Gilbert. I am Sharon Gilbert, and we're so delighted that you're enjoying these programs. And we just want you to consider going to Israel with us March 19th. 19th through 30th of 2023. Yes, and of course, the Jordan extension. And once you are over there, it's very inexpensive to fly to other countries. So we've had quite a number of of, uh, of folks who have gone along and then they've flown to Germany or to you know Rome. Sweden or Rome or wherever and gone to see other sites. We went to uh, Rome and then Sardinia one year and another time we went to England mm-hmm. and Scotland. Mm-hmm. So, you know, for $100, yes, you can do, fly to another country. You can get information about the tour at gilberthouse.org slash travel, and uh, that'll take you to the website for Lipkin Tours with the itinerary, breakdown of costs, and a place to reserve your spot on the tour. We've got more, one bus full. We're on the way to filling a second bus, and we'd yeah. love to see you on the tour to show you why we are so excited about the scriptures, because the rocks, the archaeologists who are doing such great work over there, the rocks are crying out. They really are. So we continue with our tour, and we went to the very back of Petra where there was a temple to the chief god of the Nabataeans, Dushara, and we explained why it was so important. We're at the entrance leading to the temple of Dushara, which is at the end of the colonnaded street here at Petra. This is sort of the final approach toward ground zero of what may be the greatest end times effort by the enemy. We, we, we're going to go into more depth in this in a future project, but just to summarize right here so we don't take up a, a whole hour and a half just yes, on the subject Yes, because we alone. didn't get to do this in the last year uh, in the 2018 DVD because right. we didn't go that far. Yes, yes. We w- managed to go all the way to the back of Petra. We went down the colonnaded street, and as we toured through the entire city of Petra, it became clear that this was really the focal point of the religion of the Nabataeans. This is what the locals call Qasr el Bint. This was the temple of Dushara, who was the uh, chief god of the Nabataeans. This is the only freestanding building still remaining in Petra. There have been a number of devastating earthquakes that have uh, basically destroyed every other building that was not carved into the rock, one in the early 4th century, another in the middle of the 8th century. So why is this important? Who was Dushara? Dushara is a title. It means Lord of the Shara Mountains. In the Bible, it's spelled S-E-I-R, Seir. It's equivalent with Edom. When God uh, marched from Paran, which is another name for Sinai, he came from Seir. There are a number of references that equate Seir with Edom. It's probable, according to scholars, that Dushara, the Lord of Shara, adopted by the Nabataeans as their god, when they moved into this area in the 6th century BC after the Babylonians under uh, Nabonidus defeated the Edomite kingdom, they just took over the local god, the regional god, which was probably the national god of Edom called Kaos. Kaos was a warrior god. He was an archer. The word in Hebrew, in fact, means bow. But instead of being a a weapon, it can also represent the rainbow, and that's significant because the storm god, the weather god, who was the king of the pantheon of most of the uh, people around Israel in the Levant, was of course Baal. The reason it's important to remember that this uh, this equation between Kaos, uh, the chief god of Edom, and uh, the weather god Hadad, Baal, in the Old Testament is because the chief god of the Arabians at the time of Muhammad was called Hubal, H-U-B-A-L. In the South Syrian dialect, that essentially means the Baal. What we're looking at here is a temple dedicated to the weather god of the Western Semites, Baal, identified in the Bible as Satan by Jesus. Now. Why are we pointing all of this out? It's more than just interesting history. In the 4th century AD, a Christian bishop from the island of Cyprus named Epiphanius wrote about the religion of the Nabataeans and said that they worshipped a god who was born of a virgin and that in the course of this worship, they circumambulated the sacred spot. The thing is, it's probable that Epiphanius misunderstood the Arabic word for virgin, which is ka'iba, for the word for cube which is Kaaba, which is exactly what stood right here in the forecourt of the Temple of Dushara. Ah, the Kaaba. Yes. We've heard that word before. Yes, we have. A Canadian scholar by the name of Dan Gibson has done some excellent work on this. We'll only summarize it here, but suffice it to say, we believe that the original site of the Kaaba was right here in Petra, 
right in front of the temple of Dushara. Well, that was a fascinating visit. This was another day during the tour when temperatures were in excess of 110 degrees Fahrenheit. They were, and you can see in these photographs that uh, we had a wonderful gal with us, Dawn, who was voluntarily holding her umbrella, which by that time I think she'd had a broken arm on it, but uh, she was holding the umbrella over Taylor Joseph so that he could see the screen and that the iPad wouldn't heat up. Yes, the iPad and the iPhone that we were using to take our fi- film, uh, this, this documentary, were uh, overheating. Mm-hmm. So this was a, a struggle. And I struggled several places during this tour. Uh, at Tel Dan, at uh, Masada, and here again at Petra. I really, really had a rough day. We walked very slowly back to the site of the treasury and then from the treasury. A few steps stop, a few more steps stop and we had a long hall in front of us, a long walk that was going to be in nothing but sun with no shade and so we stopped and we prayed and within seconds after ending the prayer the Lord provided an answer. A man stopped with his wagon and said, you need ride. This carriage ride will be the best money we've spent on this whole tour. It's a little bumpy. A little bumpy, but really hot today. Ah, uh, yes, it is. <sighs> Having fun? Yes, we saw everything we wanted to see on this tour, but as at Tel Dan and uh, at Masada, just. A little too much heat for my northern European blood. There were maybe two dozen people waiting down at the treasury for the, the ride, and that's why we had tried to walk through. We didn't want to stand out there in the sun and wait, but uh, I didn't really feel too badly about taking a ride and cutting in line. We made it halfway through the Sikh, and thank God for that man and his uh, carriage, because his, I would not have made it the rest of the way out. That absolutely, day. and so we spent the rest of the time as we were waiting to meet up with the, re- the, the remaining uh, people of our group, We got to go through the museum, which we discovered all sorts of goodies in there. Derek and I just love a museum. Yeah, this was like a kid in a candy store. This was as much fun as the British Museum, which we saw later during this tour. You won't see that in this video, sadly. But uh, But that video will come out next year in 2020. Yeah. So all in all, uh, an amazing tour from north to south, where we started in the north with the, the visit to... Uh, Nazareth Nazareth Village and saw there a representation of the threshing floor, which was significant because of the use of that imagery to describe the portals that uh, connect this world with the spirit realm, the threshing floor of El on Mount Hermon, where the Rephaim were summoned to a sacrificial meal in their honor and the name of El, it was believed by the pagans, would revivify or resurrect these warriors of Baal. The threshing floor of Arana, on the Temple Mount, where David purchased the, the, the spot. It was the location of Solomon's Temple. Now the Dome of the Rock sits on top of it. But at the very least, we know that Jesus Christ is returning there to finish the process of putting his footprint yes. upon that place and claiming it for once and always for himself, making it his footstool. Yes, and that is one of the most fascinating aspects of this long investigation well, from the north to the south, and seeing these various spots where the spirit realm, through these uh, Rephaim spirits, attempted to uh, hijack, to block, to stop the arrival of the uh, the Messiah, to corrupt his people into worshiping other gods. But the final footprint, when you look at the city of Jerusalem, especially the old city from above, the shape is of a sandal print. And this was the final place where the Israelites, where God's chosen people, placed their footprint in the land. And God has placed his name there. And as the Bible tells us, it is where he will dwell dwell forever. Amen. Um, If you've enjoyed this, we are so, so glad you've watched it and sort of, you know, experienced the, the tour with us. But you can go on the tour in person. In 2020, beginning, I think it's October 12th, we're returning to Israel during a time period that we pray is cooler. And the extension will not be in Jordan this time. It's going to be in Sardinia. And we're going to see if we can find a direct correlation between the architecture of Al-Ahwat and 
the architecture of the uh, the megalithic sites on Sardinia. The neurogic, uh, the neurogic civilization. Exactly, because it may well be that there is a connection between Sardinia and possibly even other areas like Spain and part of, parts of Egypt and all the way up into France and the UK, mm-hmm. that these sailors were so good at their craft that they, they went all along the Mediterranean and, and went all up into the, uh, the Irish Sea. So it's possible that there is a connection between Israel and Scotland. So for more information... See the website for Lipkin Tours, lipkintours.com. Aaron Lipkin and his team, again, does a magnificent job and made us feel like royalty all along this tour. You get treated so, so like well. Like family. You really, it is. It's like going and being with family once again. Well, if you enjoyed this and you want to learn more about and see more video, you can go to the extras and watch Rabbi Zev Parad and Pastor Carl Gallops give their teachings along with Derek giving his teachings about the Rephaim and how the the many places that we visited during this tour connect to the the ancient kings that were worshipped by the Amorites. And if you want more details specifically, including footnotes and references, check out our book, Veneration, which was released in October of 2019. It digs more deeply into the veneration, the worship of these uh, ancient kings, what the Amorites, Canaanites believed were their ancestors. In fact, the demon spirits of the Nephilim destroyed in the flood. This has been a very long deception, which continues down to the present day. It's the same thing that's been going on around the world for more than 4,000 years until God will finally put an end to it at that final battle at Armageddon when the travelers, those warriors of Baal, are destroyed and put to rest once and for all in the valley of the travelers east of the sea. And they will not rise. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us. Wow, this would change history if if Muslims would acknowledge that Dushara's temple was the original Mecca. I know, and it makes those gin blocks seem even more important exactly because right. they're cubes. Exactly right. And that gets back to what we said earlier about the mountain splitting in half. Think of it spiritually. If Petra was a place that was considered holy or sacred, if that was the location of Sinai, mm-hmm. and the fallen realm decided to try to take it for the religion they launched under Muhammad, Mm-hmm. And if that is prophetically the place where God shields Israel during well, the end times? If indeed Petra is what we think and that it is Sinai, then it was already inhabited by spirits because it was dedicated to seen the right. moon god. The moon god, yes. Har Elohim, mountain of the gods. I know. Yeah. Know. Well, more on Ooh. that in our upcoming book, probably in 2024. Absolutely. But uh, again, more information at our website. And uh, next week, back to the Revelation And uh, we thank you for watching Unraveling Revelation. Unraveling Revelation is a viewer-supported outreach of Gilbert House Ministries. We'd love to hear from you. Contact us through our websites or drop us a line at P.O. Box 78, Crane, Missouri, 65633.